dropping back to earth and I hear this, people like this part of the story. I hear this from God. Good answer. As I'm falling back, <laughs> what the heck is that? I snap. Hello, family. Welcome back to the Explore the Extraordinary podcast. My name is Betty, and today I'm joined by Donna. And Donna is a near-death experiencer. She's a podcast host. Her podcast is called Exploring Consciousness with Donna. She's a Reiki ma master, a sports medicine acupuncturist, and she was a co community college professor for 30 years. Very amazing, very impressive titles. I love titles. Um, I got to meet Donna at our most recent in-person IONS conference. We're recording this in 2024. We met in Phoenix, Arizona. She absolutely blew me away. Her story was filled with humor and wit and spirit and love. And I'm so excited for your willingness to come and serve our community on this platform, Donna. So I'm going to toss it right over to you. Well, thanks, Betty. <clears throat> you pardon my voice. Uh, part of my story was uh, I drowned in a lake and sometimes my voice goes in and out. So I'd like to apologize in the beginning for that. I met Betty there and she the, the people at IONS were re unbelievable, remarkable. And Betty was special to me. So I want everyone to know that. Um, so my near-death experience was I was out on a lake in northern New York with my family at a, during a vacation and we decided to go rafting. It's like a, it's a raft called a bullet. So it looks shaped like a bullet with two pontoons and it's towed with a tow rope. And the idea behind it is two people get on the bullet and you, you know, race around the lake and get knocked off and you laugh and you do all this. But one of the things that happened was um, when we were, we got knocked off, we got on the boat, then back on the bullet and we were ready to go again. When my brother-in-law, the driver of the boat, said, yelled back at us, get off the bullet, the boat is sinking. So I looked behind me, my, my big sister was behind me, and I watched which way she threw the rope. She threw it to the left, and we both rolled off the bullet into the water on the right. And immediately, um, you know, once you get up, we had our life vests on. I looked back, make sure she was okay. But I looked down and saw the tow rope that is a nylon tow rope that's meant to float was somehow got caught under my leg. So it made a loop and came up and strangled my leg above the knee to the bone. And my, I could hear the boat start to take off. And my brother-in-law thought we were okay because the, the bullet kind of wandered in his sight line and he, he only saw the bullet, not me. He takes off and I go, oh, this is going to hurt. <laughs> this is really going to hurt. And immediately... When that boat took off, it strangled my leg to the bone. And that was the most unbelievable pain I've had in my life. And it dragged me underwater. And I was being dragged underwater. And I knew he didn't know I was there. And so the my thought process was, oh, my God, I know how I'm going to die. He doesn't know I'm here. The power of the boat hit my chest and was hitting the air bubbles out of me. And I was like, oh, my God, I could use that air. You know, then it went to, oh, uh, what are they going to do? Are they going to bury me in Arizona or New York or what's going to happen here? When all of a sudden I popped out of my body, I, I knew I was going to drown. I didn't know when. And I went through this saran wrap thin veil and popped out and I went, oh, I'm dead. I knew I was dead. And it's it's like you said, Betty, when we talk about these stories, is as if we had a body over there, even though we know we didn't physically want, it felt like we did. I could see, I had feelings. And immediately I went, oh, there, this is eternity. I, time and eternity are very different things. And, and when we're near-death experiencers, it's very difficult for us to explain this, except I knew this was eternity. I knew I was dead. And all of a sudden, all the cells in my body started laughing and vibrating and smiling and giggling. And I, I looked down and I go, what are you guys doing? And they were going, they were, they were looking, looking at me. And they were saying, we're going to see him. We're going to see him. We're going to see the creator of the universe. And I was like, what? And I slowly looked up because I was looking down at my body and I slowly looked up and it was the edge, edge of the earth. And I could feel this, this unbelievable amount of energy coming up from the edge of the earth when all of a sudden exploded into this aurora borealis kind of, you know, took up the whole universe. It, it 
was energy like the aurora that's the closest thing i could say and i was like oh my god it's the creator of the universe and when you're on the other side you talk in terms of telepathy which means the person talking to you or the being talking to you immediately is in your head and you and it's like this message that explodes in your head and you you immediately know what they're saying even though you're not really hearing that it's like an immediate knowledge and it was like i am the creator of the universe so as i'm feeling of going toward him floating up and toward him this being said to me i started looking back to earth like oh no and as I started turning my head, I could hear, don't worry about them. And when I turned back, all, everything of earth was not in my consciousness. It was dedicated to talking to the creator of the universe. And we're floating and talking and I'm gaining knowledge and understandings. And it, But what really was remarkable here, Betty, was I felt like love was shooting through all my cells. Like I just overwhelming power of love. And I get up to the creator where wherever he is, even though there's not a place or time. And I get up to where he is and I just kind of just leaned into this unbelievable hug. And I felt as if everything in the universe or the multiverses or whatever was created just for me. In other words, myself and the being, the creator of the universe, because I can't say he, she, it. It's so demeaning to the power that I felt, the immense creation the creator of the universe. And it just was love. And I just was in this love fest of, oh, this is just beautiful. When I heard, and again, it's a telepathic hearing. Well, Donna, what do you want to do here? And I like telling this part of the story. You know, it's one of the, as a community college professor, I taught in five subject areas. And one of them was psychology. So we learned active listening and active listening you say back to the person what you think they're saying. So I go, so God, is when I hear you asking me, I mean, I'm doing active listening with God, the creator of the universe. Who does that? So I'm you know, just said, so, so what I'm hearing you saying is that you want to know if I want to live or I want to die. And then this big crackling smile across the whole universe, like the love that the creator has for each one of us is to come back and tell people it's just unbelievable, this love. And, and I just said something then. I couldn't believe I said, I said, well, since you made me, I give the choice to you. And then everything stopped. Everything stood still. And there, in eternity, there's no time. So I, I didn't know if it was three seconds or three million years. It, there's no time. I just knew I, as soon as I said it, I now have to wait. I have to wait to see if I'm staying or going. And I knew to my right, there was a line over there, a demarcation line. And I knew if I was staying, I would pass that line. So I'm just waiting and I hear, you will go back and tell everybody about choice. Now it didn't dawn on me said, when you go back. So I'm still kind of waiting, like, you know, okay, what was gonna happen here? And then I became unhinged as if I was hinged there in front of them. It's the only thing I can think of. And I became unhinged. And dropping back to earth, and I hear this, people like this part of the story. I hear this from God. Good answer. As I'm falling back, what the heck is that? I snap back into my dead body. I'm drowned. And my brother-in-law later said that he felt a tap on his shoulder. And he looked back and he saw the bullet not moving correctly. Or you know, He's like, what is this? So he turned the motor off. And when he did that, I started reaching up to the surface and I felt human hands under my arms lifting me. And my thought was, how are they going to get the rope out of my leg? It's embedded in my leg. And when I get to the surface, it's no one's there. And I have to get rid of all this water out of my, my lungs. So I'm getting rid of all this water and the rope came undone. And I was just like, what the heck was that? What was happening? Now, my sister was back at the place where we originally went in the water and she says I'm watching my husband kill my sister it was very traumatic for her so she's swimming toward me you know like superwoman 100 miles an hour but when I first got up she wasn't there and so the it came undone I could hear the boat start up and take off and I looked down at my leg and I thought it was cut in half but it was just a the rope strangled 
my leg to the bone. And so I thought if I kicked it, I would kick off my leg. So I grabbed my calf because I want to have it in the emergency room. Maybe they can reattach it. So my sister comes swimming up and she goes, I go, don't look at my leg. Don't look at my leg. She looked at my leg and we both screamed. And I said, well, you know, I'm about to go into shock. Here's how you help me. And just to, you, you can hear my story in a couple of different, if you do YouTube searches, you can hear the long story, but I know you want to get to some stuff, Betty, but basically I lived and uh, it wasn't amputated. It was strangled to the bone. So when the rope came off, it started swelling and I, I had a couple of years of hard, hard time trying to keep that leg. Thanks for sharing Donna. Yeah. I, I love your story. I, and yeah, definitely. We'll put a link to a long form of your okay. story in the liner notes of this episode so people can listen to the full thing because it's got so much in it. Um, but I do want to ask a couple questions about this. You know, um, what was your integration process like? How long did it take you to understand that you had a spiritual experience? When did you start sharing about it? It's a great question, Betty. It took a very long time. I didn't know that there was something called near-death experience. I didn't know what that was. You know, I had like, when I, as soon as I got back into my body, the integration started because I started saying, what was that? What the heck was that? It took a long time for me to even talk about it. You know, I talked a little bit about it to my best friend. You know, like, what, what was this? What could this have been? And... I had to go back and I was teaching at the time. So I, I went right from that experience back to Arizona and back into the classroom. And I, it, it just was like trying to process that. And I didn't know there was help for processing. I didn't know what it was. I didn't start sharing it until about 2018. And that was about um, 20 years after the experience. So for 20 years, I was just kind of, you know, I would, I started doing a lot of things out of the love, out of the choices that I heard. Um, so I started living a life of doing hundreds and hundreds of things while I'm here, taking advantage of being back on earth. But it wasn't, I didn't start saying it publicly until I was at the Monroe Institute about 2018. So it took a long time. Thank you for sharing that, because I think that people who watch the podcast, whether they're experiencers themselves or they're people that want to know what happens in life after life, you know, the idea that we come back from these experiences and we're just like out there sharing them super bravely is not always the case for a lot of people. It takes years and years. And I just I wanted to also mention that while you were speaking at the conference, which, you know, having to hear these experiences in person definitely carries a different frequency with it because you're really feeling the person's raw vulnerability as they're sharing their most sacred experience with an audience of people. But when you said the line, God created the whole universe just for me, I just began weeping. And even now, like I'm so emotional thinking about it and I don't get emotional girl. Okay. Like I am super detached from the human experience, but it's just, it like resonates so true to me because yeah, God did create the whole universe just for you. God created the whole universe just for me. God created the whole universe just for the people listening. And it's such a beautiful thing. How did you carry that mes message with you throughout, you know, the rest of your experience? Well, it was, it changed my whole look at the cosmology uh, and cosmology is looking how the universe is set up and structured in, in, in religious or um, physiology or all these different terms. So it, it, it came to my awareness about this, this love and this choices. And so I took that into the classroom and I don't, I don't know that I reacted much different in the classroom because I always felt a good connection with my students. I taught usually freshmen and sophomores in college. And just the reason I was teaching there is I loved those students. I loved the youth. And so it, it, it slowly crept into everything. The fear of talking about it, the fear of ridicule or what are some people going to say or what did I see? What did I experience over time? all those fears broke down to where toward the end in my classroom, I could start saying more 
things about love and how to how to act and react. Wow, that's really beautiful. I yeah, those seeds being planted, who knows how they came to fruition in the students that you were touching. That's amazing. I also was a chaplain and I, I started volunteering all over the place. So my dog and I, uh, I had a German shepherd. She had a, a two catastrophic illnesses, had a death, you know, like a shared death with her. And so we started volunteering every Wednesday for four and a half years at a local hospital. And so that that's another thing that I started doing is looking, really paying more attention to signs from my angels and guardians and saying yes to a lot of things. So you begin living your life so differently, so totally different. So I know that my watching my dog and the kids were really important too. Wow. Yeah, I definitely want, I want to, I want to ask about Sadie. That was such an amazing part of your presentation. Um, I also just want to ask this question. What was the relationship like with your brother-in-law after this experience where you died? That's a great question. For 26, 20, 25 and a half years, I couldn't wear shorts. I had to wear long pants when I was up in Buffalo because seeing my wound really hurt him. It it just made him go into a shell. And I didn't want to do that. And we never talked about experience. When I started telling my near-death experience around uh, at the Monroe Institute and since then, the more I've told people about it, it was really difficult to have my family turn their backs in the way on what I was saying, you know, and, and a lot of people that didn't have this, don't have this experience, say things like it's a figment of your brain or it's chemicals or it's, it's all this stuff, or you were hallucinating. So there's, that's important. The ions, the research part of it and the people that are doing the research saying, this is not possible. It's, it's, you, you, it's where's consciousness come from. It's not generated from the brain. So it took a long time to kind of figure out a way that I can talk to people. And I never did with him. So we just didn't do that. In April of this year, April of 2024, he was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. Out of the blue, he was doing just fine. And he got this diagnosis and he was going down fast. So I, I flew up to Buffalo and there's a point at which he was doing a life review, you know, he knew he was dying soon within the month and he wanted to sit down and talk with me. And so I, I did. And he said, I hurt you that day. And I said, don't even, don't even start that. We're not even going to go there. Um, I've had 25 years where I've been able to bring this to people, to my students, to individuals, maybe not out in public, but privately, I've been able to do a lot of good work out of this. You can't, you can't possibly hold that going into your next life. And he wanted to know about the afterlife because he was having a tough time, a lot of fear of dying, a lot of remorse. And so we, I, I got to sit and tell him what was on the other side. What is it like to, to meet the creator of the universe, what it was like. And then I'm a teacher. So I gave him homework, you know, he had like two, long, two weeks to live. And I gave him some homework and I said, anytime that you start thinking or worrying or you know, seeing, you know, I'm going to be punished. I'm going to, there's, you know, I'm just going to, it's going to be awful. I started telling him your homework is to design a, a table, a long table, a banquet table. What are you going to have for eating? What's centerpiece going to be like? Who do you want there? And it's going to be all about love. And that's what I want you to concentrate. So to take the fear out of dying is really an, another thing that I've been called to do individually. And he died. And I asked for a shared death. So did you receive that shared death experience with him? I, I did. It's not the way I wanted. So it's, heaven wasn't the way I thought it was going to be. It just yeah. wasn't. I, I don't think that it'll yeah. ever be the same experience again. Yes. I've done some regressions where I did a regression with somebody where you go back into your near death experience. And I was like, all right, beam me up. Let's do this. I want to go back into my experience. And it was a totally different experience, which was also very beautiful, but definitely not the same. He, the creator of the universe so loves us. It's, it's going to be a designer death. That's why everyone has a different near death experience. You know, people are, people say, well, it can't be true, but it's not all the same. And I go, well, there's 7 billion people. Are we all having the same experience here? So you think exactly. we're having the same experience there? Yes. So um, I, I thought I would get to walk them around and show them my friends. You know, this is where this is. This is where that is. That's what I thought sheer death was going to be. But instead, 
I woke up <clears throat> the night I had to come back before he died. And I woke up the night he died. I knew he was going to die that night. And I woke up to see him going up in a tunnel and like this Superman pose, like he was getting out of here. And I was like, wait, I thought I was going to show you around. And he goes, you did your job. You did your job. I'm ready. So just that preparing someone in that way, it wasn't up to me to what the sheer death was going to be. And that, that was stunning for me. It is so be I, I am covered in goosebumps. That's so beautiful. And I think that that might be why we're called to share our experiences too, to to give people kind of that peace of mind so that, that when they cross over, they can go in that Superman pose without fear because they've heard our stories, you know, like somebody hearing your story, hearing that God has a sense of humor, that everything is going to be okay. That is so you know, it's so comfort to somebody who might be living in a state of fear around death. Yeah, so I, I volunteered to be a chaplain at a local hospital, and I got to talk to a lot of people that were afraid of death. So the, to know that, you know, talking to people about, you know, God, about the love and the designer death and don't be afraid and just give them homework. It's not it's not just just tell them that, but to to start helping them in their mind what they would like to see. Yeah, just to rewire that whole thought process. Right. I really like that. So something that you mentioned was you talked about connecting with your angels. And I'm wondering if maybe you can share a little bit about that. Can everybody connect with their angels? Do you have any helpful tips to for other people? I've been uh, in, in my guides have been with me since in my consciousness since I was four years old. So I've known them I it, in that way. And so uh, this was a... Um, I, my gifts, like your gifts, just change through the years as you mature, your gifts mature, your conversations mature. So yes, anybody can do it. And it really, the biggest thing is what gets in the way is your belief system. So Thomas Edison said, if you think you can, or if you think you can't, you're probably going to be right. So if you're sitting there talking to me and say, I don't believe that, I can't believe your story, I don't believe anything, well, you're going to be right. It's, it's your belief system. So it's what I, what they've asked me to come back is talk about choices. So I started uh, on my YouTube channel. I have a PowerPoint presentation because I'm a teacher and it's on choices and it's, it's going to turn into um, a course of choices, very similar to a course of miracles, but it's going to be a, a book, a workbook, a YouTube channel on how you think about things. How do you how do you start with your belief systems? So my freshmen and sophomores would always come into my my uh, office hours. And the biggest thing that we talked about is what do you believe? What what are you believing? And and a lot of times freshmen are coming into college going, I'm not sure what I believe. I didn't know I believed that. I did I had this experience. I don't know how to deal with it. So a big thing for me in my mission is to help people look at their belief system and choices that they're making and how they can do a better job, perhaps. I really like that. And before we started recording, you asked to talk about A Course in Miracles a little bit. So let's do that. So that's where I, you know, I was listening to, I think it's really important to know your audience, know your students, know your interviewer. So Betty, I looked at your um, YouTube channel and I was looking at your NDE and your life. So impressed because I really like talking to young people, especially one of the one of the courses I taught was substance abuse and behavior and how not to, how not to do that. And a lot of times people, young people don't know what their belief system is or had a horrible experience or don't have the skills or don't, don't have that. So I know that I've heard of the course of miracles. And when you said it, I got chills and I, and it, my guide said, change yours into a course of choices, very similar to um, what Helen did with the Course of Miracles. So I, I, I need to find out about what her course was, but I definitely am being channeled into what a course of choices is. So I want to oh, yeah. thank you for that. For yeah. that. Thank I you. love that. I love that title. I mean, it's not Helen's stuff. It's Jesus's. No. Jesus is the author of A Course in Miracles, but I love the idea of us. And yeah, we are channeling, we're channeling information from somewhere. I mean, I know I am like, I'm, this is way above my pay grade. I know that the information that I have access to is not mine. 
It's, right. it's infinite. You know, it's like this beautiful spiritual information. And, and how, do you, uh, how do you do it? You ask me how to do it. And I tell people you start treating your guides as if they're your best friends. You don't say, hi, I'd like to know you, buddy. And then don't talk to them for months. That's right. not how you develop a relationship. So you have to have your, what do you believe about what you hear? Well, I don't believe I can hear my angels. Okay. But it's, it's not, it's not a schizophrenic. I hear voices. <laughs> it's, it's, it's being open first to signs and signals. So if you're going along and you have a, a music on your radio on, you're going down the street and you're, you're listening to the radio and you hear a song that's really meaningful to you, what's it saying in your heart? You know, where is it at that point in your life? So it could be a song, a book, a person, a, you know, you said, um, if a leaf falls out of this tree at midnight, you know, and, the, and it does, you know, so you keep asking for these signs and wonders. That's how you, be, you can begin uh, lessening the veil between you and your angels. And a lot of times people say, well, how do I know? It sounds like me. How do I know if it's their voice or not their voice? And you start off going, okay, well, you know, why don't you just think it's your voice? And, and it's not like it's it's the voice of love and kindness and empathy. And it's the the voice of the good, not, you know, punch that guy in the mouth for saying something. You know, it's not that voice. It's, 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 you know, your angels and guides are going to talk to you about making better choices or how can you think about this different or you know, it's, it's learning how to be open to that. And, and anyone can start doing that. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you 100% nodding my head in agreement. Uh, yes, you know, I and it's true, whatever you believe, that's what becomes your reality, our thoughts and beliefs are truly shaping our reality. So if you believe that angels don't exist, then guess what the universe hears you and says, okay, angels don't exist for you. Like, I b do believe that if I see a feather on the ground walking down the street, I go, oh, my God, an angel. But my boyfriend will say, no, that's a dirty New York pigeon feather. That's not an angel. <laughs> but that's my belief and his belief. And that's OK, because we're all entitled to our own. So I love that cultivating trust, just like you would in a friendship. That's what I hear you saying. And I know that my angels and guides are always talking to me in a much calmer voice than my yes. own. My own is kind of frantic and urgent. And it's something that you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have thought of if you're going along. And then, so I teach my students about how you you have an eight track mind. You always have things going on in your mind, that voice that's saying, you know, I got to do the groceries or I got to do that homework or, you know, I got to do this. So you're busy, you're busy in your mind. But when something comes out of the blue and says, oh, look over to your left, maybe it's not a pigeon feather, but maybe there's something you and your boyfriend have been talking about. And there's an affirmation. It can be that. So you're just going to be open to things, what we call coincidences, I called God incidences. Yeah. So it's a God incident. I love that. So <laughs> I want to shift the conversation a little bit. I, you know, I see a lot of comments in videos like these about pets. And I want to talk a little bit about Sadie. And you said that you had a shared death experience with your dog. And so if you could share a little bit about that with our audience. Yeah. Um, I didn't know that you could, I didn't, I didn't know if you didn't ask me, I said, I don't know that dogs have souls. You know, I don't know if dog, all dogs go to heaven. I wouldn't have said that, but in a, when she was going through her um, terrible illness in the hospital, um, I had a, that night I was doing a meditation, had an out of body, out of body experience. And in it, there was Sadie. And I was like, you can't, dogs are in an out of body experiences. And so it, it was, this is very vulnerable for me to talk about. Um, so I knew that Sadie had passed. And I just was pleading with the God that I met during my NDE. Could you please save this dog? Please, I promise if, to do wonderful things with this dog. And I just held on to her and kind of snapped back into my body. And I go, what was that? And I ran the, the next day after class, I, I ran over to the vet and they said, yeah, she had a tough night, but she came through it. And I just said, okay, we're going to do something. You're going to make it. So every day after that, I was just in there holding her head going, you're going to make it. We're going to do things with kids. And we ended up being a pet therapy team up at the local hospital every Wednesday, four and a half years with these kids. Does, does that answer your question? <laughs> Yes, yes. It's so beautiful. And I think that that's also very 
affirming for people who have pets as well. So what was your experience like after your years of service with Sadie and when Sadie actually did eventually transition completely? Uh, you're going to have to ask in a different way. My experience with the kids or with Sadie? Yeah, with Sadie. I feel like a lot of people um, oh, okay. yeah, are like after? eager for information about pets. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so she also comes. You know, she, and my friends who are psychics also see her and talk to her and tell me things about her and they haven't met her and they, they don't even know that she's a German shepherd or what she looked like and would describe her. And it would be the work she's doing with kids and Suzanne Giesman, um, evidential mediumship commander in chief assistant, you know, and I asked her about Sadie and I said, when when her kids pass, so she passes, and then she, the kids that were in the hospital, the reason they're in the hospital, they have terminal illnesses. Does Sadie gr greet the kids on the other side when they pass? And then she said, absolutely, absolutely. So I see her as a, a greeter, just like she greeted kids and families in the hospital. She's doing that on the other side. I th it's, it's So when kids are passing, and that's tough for parents, you know, there's a saying a parent should never have to bury their child, but Sadie's over there as a greeter. That's, that's what she signed up for is greeting mostly kids. So I, in my meditations, I see her on the other side and we get to have conversations. That's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> do you feel like pets can ever be incarnated into human form or do you feel like the souls are different in some way? Well, that's a, something I studied way before my, my near death, and that's transmigration of souls. And so I was looking at the literature on that. And I, you know, my personal feelings are that no, but <laughs> again, that's my belief system. So that's probably why I feel that way. You know, I might in my real death find out that that's different. But um, it, to me, it seems as if they come back as, as pets. Pets are pets, but I don't. I don't know that to be true. That could be different. It could, I'm open to whatever. I don't, I don't have the knowledge of the universe on that one. Well, I, I, yeah. I just thought just personal opinion. Yeah, <laughs> like, just, I got a lot of personal opinions myself. There you go. So I think, I think dogs stay dogs. I don't know that. I think that like the energy, the loving energy of an animal is so different from, from yeah, the yeah. loving energy of a human, yeah. which let's face it is not always super loving energy. No. No. So I do think that maybe at some sort of higher vibration, I just was just wondering your thoughts about it too. I don't doubt there's, you know, people, another thing, they think that we went over and we saw God, we know everything. Well, you know, we saw a lot and I was learned a lot, but there's so much knowledge, you know, and like you said, you know, we, we still are grumpy. <laughs> you know, I can still be grumpy. Even though I teach about choices, I can still make stupid choices. You know, just, that's, that's I just try to choice. Read. You know, and I tried to recover fast from my stupid choices. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, that didn't do go so well there. Oh, man. I have so enjoyed talking with you today, Donna. I just want to give you some space to share, to feel more complete about our time together, if there's anything else that you'd like to leave us with. Well, for the young people, the big thing for me when you first go on my choices uh, presentation is about keeping young people alive. And there seems to be in among the young people, either great um, hope for the future or those that are great hopelessness. And so suicide is really important to me in that um, in, in a suicide, you know, what if the possibility is you have to come back and do it all over again, that you pick the same packets of experiences. So in your pre-birth choices, you wanted to have this experience and you bail out here. To me, when I talk to people, especially I'm one-on-one -on -one with people about choices is, do you want to go through this again? Don't you want to come out of that experience a better person and keep evolving your consciousness? So for the young people that are feel that hopelessness, you know, you can see that I have white hair. You see that I'm, I made it through uh, up to my 72nd year. I'm 72. And so life is hard. Life is tough. You have peaks and valleys. And so if you, if you tend to be in a valley and you think that you're hopeless to find a group or find a community or reach out to others 
And suicide is that your pain is greater than your resources. So if you're in pain, young people, and you don't know what to do, there's on my website, there's suicide hotlines or to, just to get with people to say, help, help me. You know, and I say to them, do you, you don't want to go through this again. You want to keep evolving and evolving your soul. So for the young people that feel that, there are there are resources resources out there at school or in your community or you know just get through it if you can get through it with resources. Know that you you want resources greater than your pain. You don't want pain greater than your resources. Thanks for sharing that, Donna. You can also reach out to Donna or me if you're struggling with some some sort of thought like that. We also have sharing groups on IONS. Uh, if you go to isgo.ions.org, you'll find that we have like 13 sharing and topic groups a week or something like that. Maybe I'm over-exaggerating. That could be a month, but we definitely have resources here. So if you're feeling alone, please feel free to reach out and connect. Connection is the antidote to that feeling. Absolutely. And so, hear Betty's hear Betty's story. Hear hear stories of people that have have been, you know, I didn't have those skills. I didn't know. I didn't know that there was a life better than this. Betty survived that. That's really important for you to to hear those stories. We are resilient, yes. And God created this whole experience for us right now, and it's it's beautiful. I'm so grateful to connect with you. Thank you again for your service to our community, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Thank you.